Hi, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and get started. It's um, 532 and some people will probably be filtering in still, but we'll get going. Um, so welcome. This webinar is called Amazing Engineers. Um, so we're going to talk today all about bird nests, which are super awesome. Um, but before we really get moving into bird nests, I want to go over some tech and logistical things um, to make sure everybody's familiar with the platform and how things work. So if you click or move your mouse, you should have three buttons that either pop up in a bar on the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen. Um, and the first one will be a Q&A button. So if you have any questions, that's where you can pop those in there. Um, and we'll probably wait to answer all questions until the end, um, just because we've got a lot of switching and different things like that, it seems to work the best. Um, but if you have a question and you're afraid you'll forget it, um, go ahead and type that in there and we'll address it at the end. Um, the next, the other button is a raise a, your hand function. And what that does is like, lets us see like, oh, these people are raising their hand. So if we ask like, oh, who knows this bird nest, you can go ahead and raise your hand and that's where that'll go. And the third button will be a chat function, which I believe is enabled for this one. Um, and we'll try to watch that. Um, so if you have any comments or anything, um, you can put those in there. But if you put your questions in there, we'll address those at the end too. If you're having logistical problems, that might be a good place to like address, get the attention of one of us. Um, but other than that, we'll be putting links and resources in there. So you'll definitely want to check that out at some point, maybe towards the end. And we'll go over those things as they come up as well. Um, so to get started, who are we? We are the Missouri River Bird Observatory, or MRBO for short, and our mission is right there in the right, lower right-hand corner. And what essentially um, those words mean is that we work to help birds, and we do that in a variety of ways. Um, and if we're going to put those varieties in groupings, we call them our eggs that we hope to hatch. So we work to provide quality habitats for, for, for birds, which also kind of includes sustainable agriculture, which is what feeding the flock refers to. And we work to provide bird-friendly communities and people in nature. And if you're curious as to what work goes into each of those eggs, you can find more information about those things on our website, mrbo.org. Um, and I'll share that link at the end as well. So yeah, we do a lot of good stuff. So. Um, who's going to be speaking with you today? So my name is Paige Wittick and I'm the education coordinator with the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Um, and Zeb Yoko, our conservation science communicator, is also going to be talking to you, as well as Ethan Duke and Dana Ripper, our directors and co-founders of the organization. So you're essentially getting three-fourths of the staff <laughs> today, which is awesome. Um, and we're going to be talking to you about bird nests. So bird nests are truly a matter of avian artistry. They are super cool and they can come in such a variety of forms. They're really engineers. And what's really cool is you get some really unique nests, especially when you expand that out to the whole world and all the different nests of the different birds throughout the whole world. And the picture you see here is one of the bower bird, which lives in Australia. And you can see here, this is a pretty unique nest. And it's not so much a nest always, it's more of a staging area um, to show off to the female birds um, just how good he is at getting resources. So you see this kind of arch here. And if you ask any engineer, any architect, making an arch is quite a feat. <laughs> and then you've got all these little trinkets that he finds. And what I think is super interesting, and you probably noticed, is that they're all blue. And we don't really know what it is with the bowerbird's fascination with this color blue. And not all of them choose the color blue. But so it's just, it's really cool and interesting to look at. <laughs> so what we're going to be talking about today, so we'll talk a little bit what, about what are nests and why make them. Then we're each going to cover a different type of nest. So I'm going to cover scrape and suspended nests. Zeb is going to talk to you about platform and burrow nests. Ethan's going to talk to you about adherent and mud nest, and Dana is going to talk to you about cup and cavity nests, which is a great transition into talking about nest boxes, which are the human um, way of recreating the cavity nest. And then at the end, we'll have time for questions. 
Um, and you can ask questions about nest boxes or anything like that or anything else that you're curious about um, as we go along. So why make a nest? So first let's talk about what a nest is. So essentially it's any spot where a bird lays and incubates its eggs and raises its young, any spot. <laughs> Um, and one other term that I want to describe is what a brood is, um, because that can be somewhat confusing and we may um, refer to that um, throughout the webinar. And essentially a brood is all the young birds hatched at one time. So the bird lays its eggs, they hatch, they raise the nestlings, the nestlings leave the nest, and that was a brood, that group of birds that was raised at one time. So a uh, species of bird that you may be familiar with that lays more than one brood per year is the Eastern Bluebird. So the nest box here that we have at the observatory, um, the bluebirds laid their eggs, raised their babies, and then they left the nest and then they kind of like escorted them around for a bit. And then now they're out doing their own adult bluebird thing. And those bluebirds will likely come back to that nest and possibly lay another brood, either one or two or possibly even three more times throughout the summer, they will have multiple broods. So they raise quite a lot of bluebird babies throughout the year, which I think is definitely something to be admired. <laughs> okay, so why build a nest? Well, a nest provides warmth, shelter from the elements, safety, cushioning, and camouflage. So essentially, a nest provides a warm and safe place for those birds to raise their young. <laughs> so now I'm going to cover the eight main types of nests. And uh, I think it's good to preface, preface this by saying when we say types of nests, a lot of birds don't really like to fit into these different categories that we're trying to put their nests in, which I think is kind of cool. Um, but this is our best way of kind of grouping different types of nests together um, to give you an idea. Um, and so the ones that we're going to cover, so cup nests, cavity nests, platform, scrape, burrow, pendant and suspended nests, adherent, and mound nests. And you may notice that mound nests isn't bolded like the other ones are, and that's because we're not going to cover that one in as much depth as those other types. And that's mainly because a mound is kind of exactly what you might think. It's like a pie, a mound on the ground that the birds put their eggs in. <laughs> um, not that they're not cool, but you know, we're, the other ones have a little bit more explanation to them. <laughs> so to start off, we're gonna talk about the most minimalistic of nests, a scrape nest. And essentially what a scrape nest is, is a shallow depression in the ground. And there's not much to it. It's just a little dip in the ground where the birds lay their eggs. Um, but this minimalistic architecture is the nest's primary defense. Because if you think about it and you're a predator and you're looking for nests, there's really not much to find for a scrape nest. It's essentially the eggs there. And the eggs are really well camouflaged to wherever that species tends to lay their eggs. So in this picture on the right, um, you see a killdeer nest. Um, and that egg and the, even the chicks are very well camouflaged to that gravel driveway. So birds that build scrape nests, um, like I mentioned, the killdeer in that picture, a wild turkeys also build a scrape slash mound nest, and many shorebirds, including the American avocet, build um, scrape nests, and they might do it in sand or pebbles um, near the coasts. So let's talk about the one you're probably most familiar with, which is the killdeer nest. I get many um, people telling me, I had this bird, and it laid its eggs right in my gravel driveway. Like, what's up with that? And I'm like, I bet it was a killdeer <laughs> um, because they're also very loud. They'll let you know if they're nesting near your um, residence. So this is what they look like on the nest. And what's really interesting about what these guys do is they do something called a broken wing display. So if they feel their nest is being threatened, the parents will kind of, they kind of look like this and they kind of act like they have a broken wing. And what they're trying to do is attract or make your attention towards them um, and make them look vulnerable so that the predator will go after them and not their nests. So it's essentially a really good defense mechanism. And what's really cool about when you know this is when you see a killdeer doing this, it's a pretty good indication that a nest might need, be nearby. Um, because like I was saying, it's very difficult to see these nests. So in this picture, 
the, it's focused on the nest. So you can kind of see that right here. But imagine you were just strolling by here on this path. This would be very difficult to see. And so when you see the killdeer doing that broken wing display, you're like, oh, there's probably a nest nearby. And if it's in your driveway or someplace where cars might be going, that can be a good way for you to indicate and maybe indicate to other people like, hey, there's a bird nest here, try to avoid this area. So that's super cool. So yeah, that's some fun knowledge for you. <laughs> so another type of nest that I'm gonna cover is the pendant or suspended nest. And essentially these are woven sacks that dangle from branches and some are really high near where they're attached to the branches and some kind of hang down a little bit farther. Um, and some birds that you might have heard of that build these type of nests are Baltimore Orioles, Orchard Orioles, and many vireos build these kinds of nests. So the picture on the right, that's a Baltimore Oriole, and the different the nest that they make is a pendant or suspended nest. And this is also a picture of a Baltimore Oriole nest, um, which I think is fun because it shows you how they kind of like go head first. They kind of have to like dip into their nest, which I think is fun. Um, and an Oriole nest contains over 10,000 stitches in it, which I, that's a lot of stitches for something that is yay big. Like that's, that's pretty tightly woven there. <laughs> um, and what I find fascinating about these, especially when, if you ever get the chance to look at them um, up close in your hands, is that these birds, nobody teaches them how to do it. They have an instinct for how to build these nests. And scientists have observed these birds getting better as they get older. So they do get better with practice, but nobody teaches them how to do it initially. And I think that's fascinating because I need to be taught how to make a Oriole nest because they look really intense. Um, and what's also cool is each species employs a slightly different stitch or weave to their nest. So you could theoretically tell the difference between a Baltimore Oriole nest and an Orchard Oriole nest just by the weaving. But they also use, um, the birds that make pendant or suspended nests will use different materials. So in this Oriole nest, you can kind of see it's made out of, I would guess, hair, thin string, maybe some spider webs, maybe some thin sticks or straw. Um, and I'm gonna stop my screen, or my share screen, to show you guys a vireo nest that we have here. <laughs> so you can kind of see it's made off of a much thinner branch because the birds are a lot smaller and lighter. <laughs> and they're using materials more like straw and hay and more like thin branches. And they're much more tightly woven onto the branch right here. They're also smaller because uh, like I said, smaller bird. <laughs> um, so those are like different types of pendant or suspended nests. Um, and so that's it for my types of nests. So now I'm going to hand it over to Zeb who's going to talk to you guys about platform nests and burrow nests which are also super cool. So take it away Zeb. <laughs> All right, thank you Paige. Let me share my screen here. Did that go through hopefully? Can you hear me and we're good to go? Full screen, okay. All right, so as Paige mentioned, I will be talking about platform nests. Um, they're kind of simple in engineering too, um, in comparison to some of the other ones we'll get to later. But it does take a little bit of engineering to get a very large pile of sticks to stay in the top of a tree. So there's a little bit of engineering involved, but they're not overly complicated. They pretty much only do use sticks. They don't use leaves and other things. If you see a big pile of leaves in the top of a tree, that's probably from like a squirrel nest or something else. So big piles of tree, uh, sticks and trees um, in very large um, shapes is a good indication of platform nests. Um, in this example here, we've got it's tree bald eagles and sometimes eagle nests are called Aries or I think that's also pronounced Aries. It's just two different ways to spell the same thing. Um, so eagles are one of the birds that use these big conspicuous nests. Um, herons like the one pictured here and then egrets in the background also use platform nests. Um, actually, they also nest in colonies, which can be called a rookery too. It's a term for heron colonies and nests. And then other big birds like owls will use platform nests. Oftentimes, actually, owls will mooch at nests from other birds too. So sometimes they'll use platform nests from another slightly smaller predator bird, or they'll even use cavity nests from something that something else already dug up for them. So that also highlights the point that platform nests are often reused and reused repeatedly so much they'll usually they use them year after year until they fall apart 
and then you have to start over again. And they're often built up more each year over time as well. And then perhaps the most iconic platform nester that I can think of is the Osprey here. Um, they often are, they're not even in the trees. They have a platform or some sort of post that they'll, they'll build their nests on top of, especially around lakes, large rivers, and then particularly around the coastal areas. So these big conspicuous nests are visible typically, um, especially if you have a big bird inside, even if it's a baby bird like this juvenile hawk, um, especially with the bright colors that the juveniles sometimes have, um, they, they don't really hide. And that's usually because they're at kind of at the top of their food chain, especially that far up in a tree. Um, but another interesting fact is because these nests are so visible, other birds can see them, of course, as well, uh, like this ruby-throated hummingbird. And no, she's not sticking her tongue out of baby hawk. It was just a really good picture one of our photo contestants took. Um, so I had to include it here. And the reason I included hummingbirds is they actually have undertaken studies to show that hummingbirds will seek out hawk nests and build their nests nearby. So what happens is the hawk nest provides protection for the little birds in a symbiotic relationship that's called commensalism. What will happen is the hummingbirds will build their nests near a hawk nest because the hummingbirds are too small to be targets for the hawks and the hawks don't really hunt little tiny eggs either. So they really just kind of ignore the hummingbird nests. But other slightly larger birds that would hunt hummingbird nests, such in this case is the, I believe it's the Mexican jay, um, they would typically see hummingbirds or hummingbird nests as targets, but they have to be on the lookout if they're um, hunting in these areas where the hawks would be around because the hawks will eat the jays. So the jays have to alter their behavior a little bit and it makes them more difficult to, um, to successfully de depredate a hummingbird nest. So this picture here is in a, uh, from a study by Greeny et al. that took place in 2015 down in Mexico. So the species example here were Cooper's hawk, I think it was Mexican jay, and I believe it was a black chin hummingbird. Um, but yeah, all of the green dots represent where hummingbird nests were found and then where they were successful. There's still a few instances of where predation would happen in the red dots, but you can see there's a really large cone of influence that the hawks have keeping uh, kind of the jays at bay, keeping the hummingbirds safe. Okay, so back to platform nests. So there's a little bit of diversion, but it was a really cool story related to those nests. Um, some birds do use artificial platforms for their nesting, um, especially the osprey. There are lots of platforms that are set up just for um, osprey nesting. Sometimes they'll nest on top of buildings though too, um, which segues perfectly into this next one, um, peregrine falcons. Peregrine falcons technically in nature wouldn't usually be considered a platform nest. I would imagine you probably consider them a scrape nester because they just kind of dig a little spot. Um, they, in nature, they would nest in cliffs or on cliff sides. So in, uh, if there are fewer cliff sides or fewer areas available for them, they've adapted and we've helped them adapt to use what is the most um, urban equivalent to a cliff side, which is a building or tall, a tall building or a skyscraper. So I mean, if you think about it, they've got really steep face, um, lots of open air to one side, and then some little nooks and crannies that birds can, can hide in. So in this one, in this, um, this picture here is actually a still I took from a, a live Peregrine Falcon nest cam. There are several of them on YouTube. This one particularly is from the courthouse in my hometown. Um, and I think we'll share the link in the comments later on or in the last slide. Um, so I put them here because they are also another bird of prey and they're similar to platform nesters, even if it's an artificial platform. One other fun fact about Peregrine Falcons is because they are cliffside nature nesters in nature, uh, they have uh, their eggs have adapted to be more suitable for this habitat by being really pointy and they're oblong. So if the egg were to roll outside of the little scrape the nest is supposed to be in, the um, egg will roll in a circle instead of rolling off the side of the cliff. Uh, so that's really interesting too, a fun little fact about the osprey. And then, um, so we've talked about so far how these birds and these platform nesters are typically large birds. So does anybody think this is probably that bird's nest? it would be really unlikely, that'd be a lot of work for a small bird like that to try and build a nest on there. So more than likely than not, just a fun perch for this kingfisher um, because they would be in similar habitats to osprey. It's probably an osprey nest that just isn't active at this time. So I'm gonna say, nope, that's not that bird's nest. But it does segue perfectly into the next category of nests that I'm going to talk about, which is burrowing birds. So these uh, kingfishers are a perfect example of this. 
they dig their own nests in muddy banks near their favorite fishing spots. So they actually use their big beaks typically for spearing fish, but they also work well for digging out a burrow in a muddy bank without much vegetation. Um, this picture and then this following picture here are both, I took them from Flickr, which is a wonderful place where photographers host their pictures. And the reason I say that is I don't know how you get access to this, where you can see the side, side profile of an active nest, but you can see the kingfishers will dig out a tunnel and then a larger area to have their eggs that end up hatching. And then they've got a bunch of little baby kingfishers in the, in the tunnel here. And so most of the birds we've talked about so far do occur in Missouri, but for burrowing birds, it's not a very common strategy. So I had to kind of expand a little bit from Missouri. And I don't think there are any that you would see in this state. They're, they're a little bit further west of here and then actually really far east down in Florida. But the burrowing owl is the most classic example of a burrowing bird, um, as you may guess from the name. <laughs> they nest in burrows. They do not typically dig the nest themselves. Uh, they'll use old burrows, usually from other prairie dogs, um, and sometimes tortoises and other reptiles and other things that dig burrows for them. Um, but sometimes they will dig their own. Um, one thing that they will do for sure is they will conduct home renovations and help carve out to maintain the burrow with their beaks. This one looks like it might be a little bit grumpy from having to dig through really rocky soil to keep its burrow nest in shape. Um, so yeah, they mostly occur west of here, particularly where prairie dog nests are found, but there are a few populations down in Florida that often um, are found digging their own nests. Sometimes they use tortoise nests when they are available. And then the last example that I also wanted to highlight because this is about the only time of year you might be able to see them are puffins. They're also not around here. They burrow um, cliff sides up in the northern Atlantic coast. Um, so this time of year when they're nesting is about the only time you see them. Typically when they're not nesting, they scatter far out in the ocean and they spread way out. So you might see an odd one if you're out at sea up in the North Atlantic, but um, this is the only time you'll see big numbers of them. And then my last cool fact, which I've taken directly from Cornell's All About Birds website, which is a wonderful resource we will talk about later, is that baby puffins are actually called pufflings, which I think is really adorable. And that is all I have, so then I will pass it off to Ethan. Yeah, hi everybody, let me share my screen here. Um, yes, I'm going to be talking about ad adherent nests. Um, could you get her? Sorry, I'm being harassed by the dog. Um, so adherent nests, like when a, when a bird all of a sudden wants to stick a nest against some solid substrate, like a cliff wall or something like that, how do they do it? Um, there's a couple different ways birds in Missouri do that that are pretty interesting. For example, this one here is a chimney swift. Um, now, what does it look like to you that's using the stick to that? It looks like some sort of glue or epoxy, but I doubt they're going to the store and buying epoxy and mixing it up and doing that. They're actually producing this glue through glands in their mouth. They actually make a glue that helps them stick those sticks on there. Maybe you've seen them flying around Missouri, zooming around in the evening just before they all dive bomb into somebody's chimney. Um, they do use natural cavities as well, but they've really done well since uh, we don't have quite as much forest throughout North America as we once had and, and as many snags as we once had. They, they like taking over chimneys. They actually do this in Europe as well. There's the babies and once they get a little bit bigger they actually just climb out of the nest and sort of hang on the walls oftentimes. Um, and, and next to them you can see if you are so inclined and want to endeavor in such a project you could actually build a swift tower which takes some effort, but there are plans out there. This one's actually constructed by the uh, Atlanta Audubon, and I thought they made it look pretty nice too. Um, so using mud is also a technique they use. And I thought I'd throw in a mound nest here. We're not gonna go in depth like Paige said, but here's our American flamingo, just making a good old mound and then keeping them up out of the water with that. Um, here's some real mud artist. Um, the, there's a couple of species of birds that love using mud to adhere their nest to substrate and this one here is a cliff swallow and you can see it just builds this complete dome. It's almost like it's looking out of a little igloo or something 
and they they do this as a colony and so they'll they'll fly down maybe on average within like 500 meters or so from their colonies to collect mud all together um, they do a lot of wing fluttering as they're doing it um, the theory is that it, it keeps other um, mates from trying to mate and um, they get very competitive in the process. Sometimes they'll steal a little bit of mud from the neighbor's nest um, because they're so close by, um, but they guard their nest pretty well. Um, they'll also try to, um, once their nests are complete, they'll also try to take their own eggs and put them in other cliff swallows' nests called brood parasitism. And it's pretty uniquely done within this species. You can see in this particular nest, you can see that there's a, a U shape being made at first, and then they slowly construct around that to, to form it up. It takes about 24 hours of work to do this type of nest. And you can see that it's getting really close to um, this other nest right here. So they don't have to actually build an extra wall. They can just sort of incorporate that in as part of their structure. Um, see the mud on this one's beak right there. They bring back each pellet, it's all moist, and then they wiggle their bill back and forth. And later we'll show you uh, a link to a video so you can watch that happen yourself. It's pretty amazing how they, they form these nests one pellet at a time. This is strictly mud. There's sand, silt, stuff like that. The regular composition of what you think of as mud. And um, you'll, you'll find that the other birds, um, oh, here's a, here's a picture of their colony right here. Um, using a natural substrate, although you'll often see them in Missouri on bridges and things like that, um, trestles, which, which can make them a little prone to collapse due to vibrations and things. So it's always nice to see them on a natural uh, cliff substrate like that. Here's one that uses mud, and this is a closely related species of bird. And you may have seen them zooming around the grasslands and, and prairies in Missouri, the barn swallow. And they do a similar technique. They don't do it as colonies. They do it as individuals, but they'll often be many in one particular area. Um, and, and so they take these little bits of mud, but they also, as you can see, they've incorporated other material in there. So it's sort of like a paper mache kind of effect. Um, and it's still adhered um, on a vertical surface. Um, so I'll show you some other pictures of the substrates that they'll use. They'll use feathers and grasses and things. And usually these feathers and things are used to line the insides of nests uh, to keep these guys comfy. Um, and this is typically what they look like once they're getting close to fledging. They, they almost boil out of these nests. And, and then, um, there's a there's a downward view inside one of those comfy nests and that pretty much wraps it up for these guys as you can see they're an adherent nest but they also look like they're shaped like a cup like a bowl and so i'll let dana take over here and talk about cup nests and things like that thank you All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do a couple of nests for this evening. So one of these is probably the, the type of nest that is most familiar to folks, and that is the cup nest. And we've seen some nests that are kind of shaped like cups, but um, as far as what we biologists call cup nests, this is kind of all they are. And I don't want to um, minimize them because it still takes a lot of weaving and a lot of gathering of materials. And so it takes a lot of work to build a cup nest. Um, these are open and kind of bowl shaped, right, to be able to hold the eggs. The picture that you're seeing right there is actually the nest of a bird called the dick sisal, which is a fairly common prairie bird in Missouri. Um, so one of the things about these cup nests even aside from some of the ones that you've seen before that might be sort of cup shaped but are adherent as Ethan was just talking about and are built on the sides of structures. Um, 
a lot of times these cup nests are fairly exposed to the elements, particularly in comparison with the neck type of worm. But, and what this means as far as ecologically is that usually the nesting time of the species that use this type of nest is a little bit quicker because of the fact that it's exposed to elements and often predators as well. Um, and unfortunately, nesting success is usually a little bit lower in these species or in some cases quite a bit lower because of this exposure and because um, things like snakes and raccoons and nest predators can, if they can find these, um, get into them pretty easily. So most species hide them within um, bushes or grasses or trees and that certainly helps but again they're quite open. So very common nesting type though. So a cardinal nest is a cup nest. Um, that picture in the upper left hand corner is another dixissel nest um, with the young in it this time. And the one on the bottom is the nest of a bird called the chipping sparrow. And this is a pretty common little, very cute sparrow here in Missouri. Um, and the bluish eggs, with nice brown spotting, the three that you see in that nest are the actual eggs of the chipping sparrow. But you can see that much bigger one. And what has happened here is that a brown headed cowbird, which is a nest parasite, has found this nest and has laid an egg in the nest. And what will happen is the baby that hatches from from that egg is is that traditionally larger than the chipping sparrow um, babies that you smaller eggs. The coward young competes very well. So if you look around this summer and you happen to see whether it's um, a cardinal feeding something that doesn't look like a cardinal or a small bird like a small sparrow or this happens to indigo bunting sometimes if you see them feeding a baby that's larger typically and doesn't really look like them, that's almost certainly a brown headed cowbird. So I got to do this one because this is my favorite type of nest, um, partially because I studied woodpeckers for a long time, but partially because they typically have a really happy ending. Um, essentially, these are holes in trees. Um, holes can be excavated by animals. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about woodpeckers excavating um, cavities, or they can naturally occur in a tree, such as a case where a limb breaks off um, and that creates kind of a knot that gets sort of wallowed out over time. Um, cavity nests, relatively speaking, are very protected and very safe. You can imagine it's, it's a hole in a tree, therefore it's not exposed to rain. Um, it's less visible to and less accessible to predators. And so because of that, the birds that use them typically are able to have a longer nesting cycle where they can eat eggs longer and they can feed their young a lot longer. So for example, um, the dick thistle nest that we were looking at in the cup nesting slides, um, from hatching to when the birds fledge and get out of the nest is about 12 to 14 days. Whereas in a lot of our woodpecker species, it's more like 20. So it's double the time period that parents are able to invest and, and feed their young in this safe and protected little house that they have. So nest success is typically quite a bit higher. I'm, I'm not trying to give the impression that nothing bad ever happens to these nests and they all fledge young. Um, but it's typically, um, for woodpeckers particularly, nesting success is 70 to 80%, sometimes a little bit higher than that. And for our typical cup nesting birds, nesting success, by which I mean at least one young fledges from the nest, um, is 20%, 30%. Um, so it's, um, it, it gets sad starting them sometimes, quite honestly. Um, so woodpeckers are one of the key species that build these cavity nests, um, that others use. So sometimes they're referred to as nature's home builders. Um, the sort of more technical term would be primary cavity excavators because they actually excavate cavities themselves. Um, we have red-headed woodpeckers there on the top left and then a pileated woodpecker with its large cavity um, on the bottom left there. And then you can see that funny picture there is um, a downy woodpecker tossing out the, the wood shavings that it has 
um, excavated out of that particular cavity. So they take them right out and throw them out of the tree. So um, here in North America, um, they require a little bit of softened or slightly rotten wood. Um, even the big pillar, as strong as they are and as much force as their beaks have, um, they still need a little bit of heart rot in wood in order to um, excavate a cavity. The exception to that is the red cockaded woodpecker. Um, this is a bird that it was actually one of the first species listed under the Endangered Species Act, and it is not in Missouri any longer, although it did occur in, the, in our Ozark forests at one time. Um, but this is a bird that takes a much longer time to excavate its cavity because it does so in perfectly longer time, but the resulting cavity has this sap flow around it that you can see in these pictures, and that is a really good predator deterrent. Um, so one of the things that people do to try and help these, these species, and one of the reasons that it, it declined so much and became endangered in the first place is availability of nesting sites. Because um, if, you, if you cut down the tree that it has excavated in or is excavating in, it will take this particular species months to build another one. So, but once they do, it's a very, very safe house. So nature's home builders, this is because many other species, birds, mammals, insects even, use um, the cavities that woodpeckers build. And you can see, for instance, down on the bottom right there, a flying squirrel. Um, a lot of species will sort of modify the cavities that they've um, taken, not taken over. They don't steal them from woodpeckers necessarily, but they might use an older cavity. Um, they sort of modify. So if you look at that um, flying squirrel, you can see that that's not a very round hole. Um, and that that mammal has probably modified the entrance um, by chewing on it. And we'll get to why that's kind of important a little bit later. So um, we've got our Eastern Bluebird, our state bird there in the top left, a prothonotary warbler is that nice yellow guy there on the um, top right. There are flying squirrels going up. And then we have a tree swallow and then some chickadee babies. Um, and you can see kind of from the back of that picture, that's actually a nest box and the chickadee will build a nest, more of a cup nest type within that box. Nest boxes. Um, so these are really, and I bet a lot of people that are on this call right now um, probably have nest boxes in their backyard. One thing that's really important, because these are really, really helpful to our birds. Um, they're a really good thing to put out for birds. Eastern Bluebird, our state bird here in Missouri, is one example of um, how humans really helped the species come back from low numbers by providing suitable nesting cavities for them in, in the form of nest boxes. But it's really, really important to think about um, the quality of the nest box they're providing. So, for example, those ones on the top that we have a white breasted nuthatch in on the uh, left and then a, a chickadee on the right there, those aren't really good nest boxes. We're going to talk about why. Part of it's the placement. You can see that they're both, um, it looks like the nuthatch's one is nailed to a tree and the chickadee's one is nailed maybe to a fence or something like that. Um, so, we'll talk about what makes a good and bad box here. So here's our bluebirds um, on the left there. And there's a um, photo of a well-placed, well-made nest box. And that big silver stove pipe thing that's there is what we call a baffle. Um, and the reason it's called a baffle is essentially its whole point is to baffle predators and not allow them to get into the box. So some nest box rules um, for National Wildlife Federation. I thought that this was a really good um, summary of, of how to provide a really good nest box. So using untreated wood particularly, and actually someone um, that attended our Nesting for Families webinar yesterday brought up the relatively new um, recycled plastic nest boxes that are being made right now. And those are really good also. They're really, they're, 
um, they typically they're very high quality, they're easy to clean, and they're very resilient against the elements as well. Um, as long as they are made to the proper specifications, and we'll talk about that in just a sec. So an entrance that's high enough off the floor to accommodate the nest. So it depends on the species um, that you're trying to attract. They all put some type of, of additional nesting substrate in the bottom and you don't want them to build it up so high that it reaches the ceiling basically and covers the entrance. An extended and sloped roof to keep the rain out. Um, and this also serves another purpose that I'll talk about in a second. Drainage holes to keep the interior dry. You don't want to end up with your nestlings and your nest swimming in a swimming pool in the bottom. Um, so rubber walls to help float. You can imagine eventually you need to climb out of the box, get to the hole and be able to fly out. And if there's a really, really smooth interior wall, they will just kind of slip down it and won't be able to get out. Ventilation holes are especially important during our very hot Missouri summers. A side or top panel that allows access for monitoring um, and cleaning. So both of these things are really important. Um, monitored nest boxes typically have a higher nesting success rate that has been shown. Um, that boxes that people don't monitor. And we would in no way suggest, you know, every single day and check um, things because if you see something like say a wasp is trying to build a nest in there or mites have gotten in there you can actually help the birds by doing something about that and if you never monitor that you would not know that um it's also a great opportunity to contribute to citizen science programs and i think Paige has a few resources that she's going to quote that um will will encourage you to do that because so much data that have been collected um on these various nest box nesting species have been done by home citizen scientists. Um, also at the end of the season you really need to clean that nest box out so that door is in for that as well. No outside perches. Um, I think the old sort of like old school nest boxes used to have a perch outside which one would think would be useful to the parent but actually it's also useful for for predators to sit there and, and <laughs> wait for somebody to come in or out. And then of course the baffle. So a little bit closer look um, at the nest box. So you can see the sloped roof. Um, one other thing about it allowing rain to sloof off basically and, and not go anywhere near the nest entrance is that if you would picture a raccoon and hopefully you have a baffle, pass the baffle somehow, climb up onto the box, the longer it's sloped roof is the less likely that raccoon can reach his little hands into your nest box and create havoc. Um, so that nice sloped long roof serves a couple purposes there. You can see the door. Um, some nest box makers um, and some individuals have decided to do this too, putting that little grate in the bottom. Um, again, as a, a substrate, but also um, to if any moisture does get in, the nest is kept off of that moisture. And then that metal circular item there on the front, um, this is called an excluder, and you can purchase these for $2 um, approximately. And there are a bunch of different sizes out there because there are different specifications depending on who you're trying to attract to the nest. Um, and basically what this does is it disallows things like squirrels, and sometimes woodpeckers will do this as well, for modifying your the entrance. And you wanna keep your entrance at a certain width, um, depending on, you know, do you want a house wren? Do you want a bluebird? If it gets big enough, you're gonna have things like starlings that come in, um, non-native species that you don't want there. So you, once you've built or you've purchased your box, you don't want anything modifying the size of that entrance. So uh, just a couple more examples um, of birds that use do use cavities um, and therefore nest boxes. House wren, they're at the top left. Northern flicker, so northern flicker is a woodpecker, but they will sometimes use nest boxes um, either for nesting or sometimes just for roosting in the winter time. A wood duck, um, there on the bottom right, and then a screech owl. 
So there are many, many, many nest box plans online. Again, Paige is gonna share some resources with you. We would definitely recommend things like the North American Bluebird Society. They actually do have a little bit more than bluebirds on there. Um, there, there has been a lot of research done into what are the most beneficial specifications for these boxes. And we recommend that you put out good boxes. Back to you, Paige. All right, so I'm gonna quickly share some resources and then we'll get started with answering some questions because I know we already have a bunch of good ones in there. Um, so I'll just quickly go through these. So um, that top one there is a resource if you have kids or grandkids that are looking for activities to do that are nature related or bird related, um, you can visit that link there. That's just our website. And then if you go under like education and outreach, that resources for teachers and parental guardians page will be there. And on that page has um, some of the things that Dana talked about. There's a special nest box section on that page that's gonna have the link to nest watch, um, to the North American Bluebird Society, nest box plans, all that good stuff. Great place to start um, if you're looking to get more involved with birds. <laughs> um, another really, really cool resource that I believe Zeb mentioned um, that I'm a big fan of as well, and I go on all the time when I'm like, what's that specific thing about that one bird, is all about birds.org. So um, if you're like, hmm, how long does it take bluebird eggs to incubate again? You can look on that, put an Eastern bluebird or any bird, and it'll give you that specific number. And I don't know it off the top of my head, but I assume it's like two weeks. <laughs> um, and then there's also the Cornell Labs Birds of the World website, which is fantastic. There's the Peregrine Falcon Live Cam that Zeb mentioned, and there's a, a bunch of different um, like nesting cams that you can watch. Um, it can be really cool to watch like barn owl ones too. I know those exist. Um, and I believe those are on that resource page. And then the video of the cliff, cliff swallow nest building, highly recommend watching that. I don't believe it's very long and it really shows you how they go about doing that. And then it's got cute cliff swallows that have that mud on their beak, which is just great. Um, <laughs> and then Dana mentioned the nest box plans as well as um, some educational brochures. Um, from Bird's Eye View in Jefferson City about how to build some nest boxes and different resources and good tips, good place to go for tips on, hey, I have this issue with my nest box, what should I do about it? <laughs> um, so this webinar will also be recorded and put on our website. Um, so if you have, you want to look up these resources later, or you're like, wait, what did they say about that thing? You can look at that recording and you'll be able to figure that stuff out. So I'll stop sharing my screen so we can start answering some questions. Um, but those are those resources and I encourage you to check them out um, if you're curious about anything we said. <laughs> so I know there's a lot of great questions. And I think the first one I saw was in the chat box. <laughs> and it said something, oh. What do the ospreys do if there are no human provided platforms? So I'm gonna let Zeb talk about that because he's the one that talked about platform nests. <laughs> sure, so I, I did double check while I was waiting because I saw the question. Um, I was pretty sure at first, but what they'll do is they'll use dead trees or snags or other trees out there and they'll build their nests on the tops of those. They'll use live trees too, but anything that's close to the coast or, or anything that's close to the body of water that they hunt over, they'll they'll use. Um, sometimes they'll even use like power poles and other stuff like that. So even if there's not an intended man-made resource, sometimes they might use those. But there are like naturally they would use a dead tree or a live tree too. Awesome. <laughs> um. So, uh. Teresa asked, do scrape nesters have low nest success also? Um, because I'm assuming like Teresa, she probably noticed that it's essentially a really, really, really simple cup nest. <laughs> um, and they're very, like Dana was saying about cup nests, they're very exposed to the elements. I don't know if I can answer this question super 
factually. So if anyone else has an answer that they know for sure, feel free to chime in because I'm, I'd have to look it up. <laughs> I can only read, so there's many different species that build scrape nests. The ones that I can talk about from personal experience really are killdeer and mountain plovers um, out west. And I, I guess I don't, I don't have a, a you know, 20%, 40%, et cetera. The, the problem, if you will, with, with some of the scrape nests is where they build, right? So um, they're going to be exposed to the elements and exposed to predators as much as any cup nest, maybe a little bit more because there's no overhanging vegetation typically. Um, but they're also on roads and driveways, um, and in the case of mountain plovers, in agricultural fields. And so they have that added danger. So um, I've seen that nest success be really low in those species, but it's because of the additive of human activity versus what, you know, cup nest, open cup nesters normally have with predators and elements. I think that answers that question. I think to add on to that too, actually, even, yeah, but I, I think to add on to that too, I mean, in the net natural environment, um, those the killdeer and other shorebirds will nest in scrapes along river streams or, or lakes. So if the water level changes too, that can be an impact. So there's all sorts of environmental dangers that can happen to those, but they're camouflage, so they don't have as much predation, but so there are other things that can happen to them too which I think I kind of was going to tie into, we had a question about the correlation between nest security and the number of eggs in a nest. I think that's, um, it's a really good question and it's a lot to try and disentangle because like the different <laughs> nest structure is definitely a part of it, but there's a lot of different strategies. Again, there's camouflage of your eggs, where you nest, when you nest, some species will lay a larger clutch at the beginning and then some will try and re-nest if it doesn't work. So necessarily how safe it is, um, is part of it, but there's a bunch of different strategies for how to keep your species on the landscape, I guess. It's, that's my so, two cents on that one. I agree. And I I think that's a really, really interesting question that I've never seen anyone address. Um, I love Rockney and Louie and Corb's questions were great. Um, so, I mean, in, the experience of that I've had and like, to, you know, that other people have had working on various species, I'm sort of tempted to say no, that there's not a correlation because so something like a chickadee is a, is a cavity nester and will lay like eight eggs. They have a really big nest. Um, but woodpeckers are typically three or four. Um, and cardinals are four or five, and dick thistles, which are, you know, cardinals and dick thistles being open cup nesters, are four and five. I think our grasslands crew has even found six, although that's not typical. Um, hummingbirds lay two, am I correct, guys? I think yeah, it's, it's really two. So. And they're, they're an open cup nest, and that's going to lead into Dan's question about who builds the nest, in my opinion, but um, I don't from the range of, of typical clutch sizes versus nesting strategy, I don't think there is a correlation. And look at raptors, typically lay a very low number of eggs, um, and their young often don't make it because of other disturbingly violent reasons like siblicide. Um, so there, yeah. Anyways, there's, there are lots of different reasons. Right. To bring up another <laughs> example of, of the amount of uh, eggs per nest for nest type, you can think about other ground nesters like um, quail and turkeys that lay like a dozen eggs or so versus these oh, killdeer and other ones that only lay a, a couple on the scraper ground nest. So yeah, maybe not a correlate. But super interesting to think about. <laughs> um, so yeah, let, why don't we go ahead and go yeah. for Dan's question. Who builds the nest, male or female? Um, depends on species. 
So if there's a species that you're curious about in particular, um, feel free to put that in there. But like Dana mentioned the hummingbird, like the female makes the nest. She does pretty much all the work um, in terms of nesting for hummingbirds. He just doesn't let her go to the feeder. Um, <laughs> and then uh, like uh, bluebirds or house wrens. House wrens are a cute example. The male will find the nest box and build the nest and be like, here, do you like this one? Or I, I this one's also mine. What about this one? <laughs> um, and bluebirds kind of do something similar to that too. So it depends on species. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and the examples that I give are some of the birds of prey at the together. Swallows and um, the, the cliff swallows and the barn swallows, they, they help each other out. And, and uh, other birds like those vireos and things often help each other build the nests. Um, and then for the whole nest cycle, I mean, there's some birds out there that are great parents. And I'd say a tops would be woodpeckers because the, the male helps incubate and really, you know, take over the shared duties and responsibilities pretty well. Zeb, what did you say? <laughs> I, I said with the, the birds of prey, a lot of those rafts, they also will work together and build the nest. Uh, so yeah, there's there's some of each different scenario where it's just the male, just the female, or both. Uh, that's kind of any, there's an example for each type of those. There's some bird that does that. Isn't there a, a plover in the north, like up on the north slope of Alaska that does the male, does all the parental care, right? And he's actually the more drab one, and the female's more colorful. So kind of a, a reversal of rules. Well, and then penguins too, but they don't really build a nest, I guess. <laughs> and then, yeah, so there's the example of neither of them build the nest, and penguins or the cowbirds or the brood parasites. So every possible scenario is covered by some different bird species. Which is why birds are so cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, answer another question. So I keep getting a lot of Phoebe's nesting next nesting along my house. Is there any way I can relocate or provide um, store bought birdhouse for them? Um, so it, so once the bird has like their eggs and babies in the nest, I would never recommend trying to move it um, unless you well no I would you know it's best for that there. Um, I get really excited when the Phoebe's nests on our porch. I love watching them. I think Phoebe's are super cute. So, um, as far as, and I, is, so they make that adherent nest that, um, Ethan was kind of talking about. So they're not likely going to nest, um, as much in a, in a birdhouse or a nest box. They're not cavity nesters. Um, so they like, they love the shelves and like things of houses because essentially what they do is they'll find like a ledge, build their nest so high so that it's the perfect height for when the roof slopes down so that their nest is protected but it from predators, but they can also still get to it. Um, so I guess, and someone else feel free to chime in, but I would say just learn to enjoy them. <laughs> yeah, I was a little worried about um, a, a pair nesting at my mother-in-law's house and because they just tend to put them on some pretty precarious places and i was really afraid that those those babies were just going to flop out of there as soon as they started growing so i took a little tiny shelf and i just sort of built it in there and it looks pretty nice you know it's aesthetically pleasing and and extended the shelf out for them and the only temporary problem or issue that we might have is when they really start feeding the young and they can't take all the fecal sacs out they start pooping a little bit but the, a little hose and a little water, and you got happy babies. It's, it's a pretty good deal. Yeah, okay. Um, so do the cowbirds eat other birds' eggs or just leave their eggs in other birds' nests for them to care for their babies? Um, as far as I'm aware, they don't do anything to the other eggs. They're just like, yay, I found someone else's nest. Whoops. Oh, Ethan. I okay. believe there's reports of retribution. Oh, okay. If their eggs are removed by another species, I think sometimes they'd come back to wreak havoc. Well, like 
So there, there's anecdotal reports of them. And I think there's also some sort of report, something, some papers titled something like Mafia Wars or something where they, they, they retributing towards particular nest owners that are good at defending against them. So they're not, I, that's, I wouldn't say they do that as a normal occurrence though. I think they usually just dump them and go. And that's that brood parasitism that I was mentioning that the, those little sneaky cliff swells will also do. Wood ducks do it. There's a few other birds that really do that. But wood ducks will also raise babies. The, 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 the brown-headed cowbirds just won't raise any babies. They just dump their eggs and go. Cool. I haven't heard about that. So that's super interesting. <laughs> There's a lot of neat stuff out there. Um, so if you dig into those resources that Paige mentioned, you'll find all sorts of interesting anecdotes. And, and I know that one that Birds of the World that I mentioned does come with a subscription, but if you're really into this stuff, it's really worth it because they, there's a lot of literature that they provide resources and links to that you can dig in on all these topics, whether it's their migration, whether it's their breeding habits, whether it's their nests, um, it just sort of culminates all the good literature out there. Great, so I'm not seeing any more questions and we're past 6.30. So I'm thinking we can wrap up and say goodbye and thank everyone for attending. Um, we really appreciate it. And like I said, if you wanna share with your friends, the recording will be on the website as well as all those resources. <laughs> and if anybody has additional questions, feel free to email any of us. And if we don't know, we'll find out or we'll try. Enjoy migration, everybody.